Hello, everyone. My name is Payman Parham Al Awadi, and uh, this is my brother Mohammed. We are from the United Arab Emirates, and we produce and host a social media driven travel show called Pita Planet. We're very privileged because we get to travel around the world and we meet some of the most inspiring young thought leaders of our generation. We actually use travel as, as a tool, a medium to create communities and we connect people who have amazing ideas with others who can possibly help them bring those ideas to life. We call this social travel. Today, our show is one of the most watched shows in the Middle East region, and we broadcast into 50 million homes. We're two kids from, uh, from Dubai, and I'm not sure how we got here, but <laughs> <laughs> it's... Uh... <laughs> It's, thank you, thank you. It's, it's really an honor to be part of the Clinton Global Initiative this year and uh, an honor really to meet all of you. So, so I wrote a little something uh, before coming here and then I scrapped it on the plane because I, I, I think I came up with something a little bit better. So bear with me if it's bad. <laughs> I'm impulsive like that. Throughout our history, there have been many incredible developments that have impacted our lives. The internet and social media are two of them. As social networking grows and knowledge becomes accessible to anyone with an internet connection, more and more people want to participate in determining their future, our future. I don't mean this just in the context of government elections. Social media users want to participate in everything from your product development to your supply chains. One particularly important area they want to influence is human development. To explain this as a new phenomena attributed to the growth in social networking would not paint a complete picture. You see, even in ancient times, tribes, clans, and communities came together to discuss the factors that influenced their lives, and then together they impacted change. To overcome adversity, collaboration had to be embraced. Today, new tribes are emerging. It's the social tribes who are impacting change, not just offline, but online. One where passports, skin color, race, ethnicity, and religion are no longer the factors that distinguish them. Today, social tribes are bound by common belief or common beliefs. We believe that this is impacting urban cities in a beautiful way and turning them into labs of innovation. The lines between government and civil responsibilities are becoming blurred. The question is, how should we address it? Do we redraw these lines or do we embrace this movement of government, private and civic collaboration? Our amazing guests today are the products of these blurring lines. So today, we hope to inspire a new approach in supporting their commitments. One that doesn't categorize engagement based on traditional roles and responsibility, but on the notion that anyone can play a role in bettering people's lives across the world. Today in this room, we are one tribe. Who or what we are is secondary to that. Let's forget for a moment where we are told our responsibilities lie and instead blur the lines that separate us. We want you to think of how you can help our guests achieve their call to action. They're amazing people with an amazing story to share with you. If there's one truth we've learned from filming our, our show, Peter Planet, around the world, it's that great things are achieved when empowered people collaborate to bring back dignity to other people's lives with our next guests. So I'd like to take this opportunity to, um, there we go, there they are. So uh, David Hertz, Hi. how are you? And Uredia, Hi. how are you guys? What up Brazil? <laughs> Thank you, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so do you guys just see the two of us? Or are you guys seeing the 1,000 beautiful people sitting over here and and listening to you guys, or do you see two you beautiful people sitting over here watching you? Actually, we're seeing ourselves. Now oh. we can see you guys. <laughs> I'm wearing my best dress. <laughs> you look great. 
Thank, thank you. you, thank you. David, I'd like to just take a quick uh, few moments to, uh, to introduce you. Uh, so uh, David Hertz is the founder and CEO of Gastro Motiva. David Hertz founded Gastro Motiva in 2006 and currently serves as CEO. Gastro Motiva is the first socio-gastronomic organization in Brazil that uses the potential and responsibility of gastronomy to generate empowerment and social awakening. Through peer-to-peer -peer education, it trains underprivileged people on becoming professional cooks and food mentors. And Uredia, who's sitting right next to him, is student number one. And today, also a part of, uh, of the business that you've, uh, that you've built, uh, David. So, so as a testament to how much Brazilians love food, the food and beverage industry accounts for 9.3% of the country's GDP and is one of the largest employers in its city. Gastromotiva is the first Brazilian organization to harness the love of food into employment and educational opportunities for low-income youth. So David, why did you choose food as the currency for community change? Well, first of all, I just want to share how honored I am just to be here. We are all of us really honored to be part of this commitment. And uh, I'm happy we're all over lunch because I think you can grasp much more connected to our cause. <laughs> For me, cooking, you know, is an important human activity. It's about love, it's about sharing, it's about people. When we eat, we get something that gets common to all of us. We get to understand one another, we get connected to the people, to the histories, but much more than that, it nurtures our soul and body. To tell you why we got connected to this and why I chose food, I want to bring one story to all of you. In 2009, we were already doing our vocational training program. I met Diego Santos. Diego was 20 years old, but he has been working since he was 14 to generate all the income to his family. He was just unemployed from the supermarket he was working with. But we selected him because of his passion and his will to change. At Gastromotiva, we just don't teach only culinary skills. We try to get our students to really understand the connections between man and nature, the region of the ingredients, the importance of health, our life that comes from food, and how the value chain affects our lives. And Diego really got connected to this concept, like so many other Gastromotiva students. He started to work in a restaurant, an organic restaurant, and he became an educator in our program. By that, he pursued his apprentices and he got into university, got an MBA on gastronomy science. He's right here, and he's just with us, uh, and he's just being selected to do a course in Italy in the Slow Food University. Oh my God, and that's he's amazing. To get there with them. <laughs> okay, so, now we believe you. Now we believe you. Story about life skills, empowerment, self confidence. We want to generate active citizens. We already achieved 1,200 people in Brazil. So that's the power of gastronomy, social gastronomy. So, uh, David, you started uh, Gastro Motiva in 2006 in Sao Paulo, and then you expanded to Rio de Janeiro in 2013. And at the CGI Latin America in 2013, you said that you would expand to El Salvador and also uh, try to get in more students in Sao Paulo. How have you leveraged the cities to really create more impact and help you scale? You know, food is about passion. You see all these students working, it makes a real change. We have, over the years, increasingly demands for chefs, from restaurant owners, from foundations that want to replicate our model. We chose Salvador, but it's cultural heritage, and also the best people that we found there. Uh, we already started our activities in Salvador, so we are reaching that commitment, but we are trying to see how we can increase our public impact in cities like Rio and Sao Paulo, who are ready are. So I want to also bring here two examples. The first one, which is really important for our methodology and how we replicate, is, as you mentioned, we use peer-to-peer -peer education. You, we, we use that to really generate mass-scale healthy uh, workshops 
and this year we were able to achieve already reach 30,000 people. Can you imagine that all of these students who are here with me, we have others more who couldn't be with us, they, while they study, they go to their communities and they replicate what they learn. The other thing that I think it's too important is how you take this methodology to other publics. How do you take to immigrants that are arriving in Brazil? But we, four years ago, we decided to take this to prisons, to female prisons. How do we adapt this to inmates so when they get out of prison, they feel empowered to go look for a job? So four years ago, we started this with the public sector and with the chefs, most of you must know, Alex Atal. And we were able to turn this into a public politic this year. And I want to share with you Lucy Mara, who is just here with me. She's been on and off prisons for, three, for 12 years. For three times she came back there. But now she really took the idea, the chance to really take care of her life. And she's working with us. So you have to do public politics to change this, to make this real as a movement, to scale up in all these cities. Yeah. You, you know, uh, yeah. thank you. David, it was uh, just a pure coincidence, but we featured one of your graduates in one of our episodes on, on Peter Planet, and she went on to start uh, Favela Organica. Uh, Regina Celli. Regina Celli. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 what, yeah. What, a, what a small world. But we, we also were lucky to have uh, Yuridia uh, over there, who went from being a graduate of Gastromotiva to an employee of your organization. And, and I want to ask you, uh, Yuridia, how did becoming a peer educator change the way you viewed your city and fellow residents, you know, after, after having, you know, these people believe in you and invest in you? Eu aprendi a fazer escolhas, tomar decisões. Eu me descobri um ser humano com maiores responsabilidades e com vontade de mudanças. Well, I just tried here. I feel I was empowered to make better choices. I found out I'm a woman with great responsibilities and urge to change the community I live in. É muito gratificante saber que como educadora eu posso inspirar pessoas que moram em comunidades a mudarem de vidas, a mudar suas expectativas e perderem seus medos e se tornarem cidadãos. Well, very grateful to know that as an educator I can inspire people from the favelas to lose their fears, to have better perspective, and to help them to become citizens. That's so awesome. It's amazing. I, I love the look on your face, you know, when, when she said that, uh, David, and the smile, you know. <laughs> You're a, a big part of, uh, you know, what's, what's, what's happened, obviously. Uh, another question that I have is, uh, one of the key links, you know, with uh, skill development and employment is the employer. At the end of the day, you're going to train people, and you want them to have uh, jobs. So I know one of your targets is to make sure that 80% of your 400 students actually end up having jobs. And you are very aggressive in terms of um, speaking to a number of different restaurants and restaurant operators to make sure that that happens. How are you leveraging this um, private, private partnership or private public partnership to, to, to get to that stage? Well, thank you for this question. I think, you know, I always knew that building last longer relationship would get us here. That's where we want to get. You know, we also knew we couldn't do this alone. We had to inspire the market, the restaurant market, the catering business to also generate impact within this business. So we always try to create these strong alliances. Just to put in numbers nowadays in Brazil, we have over 70 restaurants that engage in the program. They, they also fund the program, which is like giving, helping us from Motiva with at least $100 a month, which is the cost of our trainee. But they become much more than that. First, they come because they want the professionals we have, that we, we help them to develop. But then they become part of the social gastronomic movement and get engaged. That's how we took our program to a prison, because chefs want to get engaged with their causes. You know, another uh, example that I can give, if, and all of you can relate, this year we had two international restaurants from New York doing benefit dinners for us, 
One is the number one restaurant in New York called the 11 Madison Park, and the other one is the Fat Radish. And together, with the support of Brazil Foundation, they helped us to raise money enough to fund 100 trainees in Rio de Janeiro. Can you imagine that? That's Two awesome. nights, huh. we're able to fund 100 trainees in Rio. And the way we do, we have our facilities helping. We do this with laureate universities. They have the facilities. And because with them, we can bring their skills, talents, and dreams and match with the market needs. So that's why I really, I want everybody to get this, how important is this partnership with not-for-profit who, who send us their best trainees, universities, the private sector, and the public sector to reach every time more people and help public politics to really work. Thank you very much, uh, David. David, we're, we're out of time, but uh, I want to give you the opportunity to say one last thing very, very briefly. So since you've al already achieved your commitment to CGI, what's next? Very briefly, very quickly. Well, you know, I'm one person with one dream in one country, but I want to reach a million people. We have countries and chefs and cities really wanted to, in, to be part of it, but we need more people with us. I want you that is in the audience to join us, to grow this as a social gastronomic movement. Be part of Lucimara, of Diego, be part of this movement and help us this really to take all over the world how social gastronomy can improve lives. You hear Thank that, you people? Much. If anyone is there, you know, <laughs> uh, we have some people who really know so Alexandra Pai from the Fat Reddish, she's on the audience. Please talk to her, talk to us, be part of this with us. Fantastic. Thank, Thank you, you so much, much. David, Oredia, the you, team. David. Thank you to the team. From Thanks for letting Chica. us tell your story today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. And on to our uh, next guests. And um, it, it would probably take a number of, of pages to, to talk about everything that they've, uh, that they've done. Uh, I'm going to do it very brief from here, and I'm going to ask them to take over when they get on stage. Um, it gives me great honor and pleasure to introduce uh, Mr. Gary White, the co-founder and CEO of Water.org, and Mr. Matt Damon, also the co-founder of Water.org. Appreciate it. So if you guys would allow me just to say the couple of words that I have over here, and then we can go straight into to our, to our questions. So water.org is a nonprofit organization dedicated to empowering people in the developing world to gain access to safe water and sanitation. Uh, Mr. White's entrepreneurial vision has driven innovations in the way water and sanitation projects are delivered and financed, and these innovations now serve as a model in the sector. Mr. Matt Damon is, a, is an Academy Award winner, uh, an actor, a screenwriter, producer, and humanitarian. Mr. Damon has long been devoted to environmental and social issues, including climate change science, early childhood education, fighting hunger in America, and ending extreme poverty and mass atrocities. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Matt, Matt, I know you've never been in front of a camera, but you know, do your best. <laughs> Don't make us look bad. <laughs> you guys are doing great, by yeah. the way. Yeah. <laughs> We're on every Sunday night at the... <laughs> <laughs> this is your moment. The doors yeah. are locked. So. <laughs> I know. Give me your money, everybody. <laughs> OK, focus. <laughs> I just had a cup of coffee in the back. So, <laughs> sorry. So I love how both of you explain the gravity of the global water crisis and how you put into perspective using statistics. Um, one example is a child under five will die every 21 seconds because of a preventable water-related disease. Think about that. I'd love for you guys to share some more of these statistics uh, with our audience. Yeah, I mean, that one was always the one that was kind of arrested me the most when I first heard it, and I've tried to repeat it as many places and in as many ways as I can. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, the, the, 
the, the problem is just so massive. Um, but you know, given that given that we know a kid is dying every 20 or 21 seconds from something that's completely preventable, uh, I mean, think of it in those terms. You know, we solved this here in the West a hundred years ago. You know, just imagine if we solved AIDS tomorrow or cancer, and in a hundred years, children were still dying by the millions. Um, it's just, it's really, it's really unconscionable. And, and that was really kind of what drew me to, to water was the, was the enormity, water and sanitation, the enormity of the problem, problem and how it really underlined everything. We were talking about extreme poverty and engaging with extreme poverty. You cannot solve poverty without solving water and sanitation. Absolutely. I mean, I, I have, thank you. I have a few more stats over here, Gary. If you oh, you would ask me in. about stats. Sorry. <laughs> 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 but it, it's, it affects 2.6 billion people around the world. G Gary, you yeah, want to? I mean, there's still, today, you know, 740 million people who lack access to approved water supply and 2.5 billion lacking access to sanitation. And I think that, the, that really, it's a huge issue statistically, but when you get behind the numbers and what this is really about, you know, we're talking about, you know, urban areas and sanitation is just... It's unimaginable the issues that are associated with sanitation in large in mega cities today. And they, you boil it down into like human cost. And I know there was a, a story this summer about these two girls in India who were practicing open defecation. They had no toilet at their home. And if you're a young girl, you don't go out during the day to defecate, to relieve yourself. You wait all day. And these girls were out searching for a place to, to relieve themselves. Uh, and they were raped and murdered simply because they didn't have a toilet at their home. And you multiply this out by the number of people that, that face this issue in terms of the health issues of that. You know, if you're, you aren't relieving yourself, what it does to your body. Uh, you know, women who are carrying water their whole lives and the chronic back pain that goes along with it. And all of these economic things that contribute as well, malnutrition and stunting. There's a lot of reports out now about we're not going to make any progress on malnutrition and stunting until we get adequate sanitation in these cities. So I just wanted to let you know that it's, it's, it's weaves its way through everything, but on the upside, there's a lot of positive things. There are a lot of positive solutions and ways of approaching this. Yeah, I, I mean, one of them is for every dollar invested in clean water and sanitation, there's a 5 to $8 return in GTB, GDP growth. Yeah, it's, it's shaving huge percentages off of GDP right now where, where economies could be growing. Uh, but you don't, you have to have that foundation. Uh, and for us, I think we take it so much for granted, but you can't imagine a modern city even beginning to think about developing, you know, an internet or uh, transportation until you get water and sanitation. Yeah. yeah, speaking of technology, there's more people in the world who have access to a cell phone than they do to a clean glass of water. Uh, it, it's very interesting because, you know, I mean, we come from a part of the world where we know the value of water because our ancestors had trouble finding water, you know? So, so that value is there, and that's why, you know, in our region, there's a, a, a lot of financial resources put behind water initiatives. But, uh, Gary, you found that, you know, 50 to 60 percent of, uh, of uh, a failure rate is when you don't have the user involved in implementing the, uh, the solution. And, and, uh, and that's where the water credit uh, initiative uh, comes into play. Tell us a little bit more about that and how that's, that's working. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the, the, again, the bad news is that there's so many people that still lack these services. The good news is that uh, there are ways to reach them. There's never going to be enough charity in the world to make this problem go away. So we have to look at innovative and market-based solutions. And, you know, Matt and I have traveled around a lot, you know, in some of these slums uh, around the world, and particularly, you know, people we've met in India, and meeting a woman there who was paying 125% interest to a loan shark so she could just build a toilet. Other women doing the same to get a water connection. It's like, what if we could connect microfinance together with water and sanitation because it wasn't being addressed by microfinance because it wasn't seen as income generating. So what we help to do is nudge microfinance towards making loans so people could afford to pay to connect to a water utility or build a toilet. And now what we've done is reached over 1.6 million people with loans instead of charity. This has leveraged more than $70 million in commercial finance that comes in to fund these loan portfolios. 91% of the borrowers are women and 99% of the loans are repaid. Wow, wow. That's, amazing. that's awesome. That's amazing. That's huge. And actually, we should say, you know, we, 
through this, through kind of abandoning the old direct impact model and just digging wells, um, and 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 doing water credit, which Gary's being very humble. He, this is a, an idea that he pioneered, and um, you know this is really scaling now. So by the end of next year, we're at 1.6 million people that we've reached. By the end of next year, uh, we'll be at 3 million. So it's really scaling quickly, and and this is all made possible in, in India from this uh, grant we got from the PepsiCo Foundation, and they've been incredible. They've been with us from the very beginning. Matt, we read a document where you both talked about reorienting the global conversation around water stress, and you categorized them um, into two. So resource-constrained stress, uh, and you cited Asia as, uh, as an example, and finance-constrained stress, and you cited Africa as an example. So what are the challenges and, and dynamics of each? And both of you feel free to answer that. Okay, are we, uh, this had flashed for a second. I'm wondering if we need to roll the video, though. Sorry, oh. are we okay? Oh. I, I, think, I, I didn't see that watch there. Oh, we yeah. need to wrap. Are we supposed to stop when it goes to zero? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm particularly, I'm particular, you know, I hosted the Jimmy Kimmel show last year, and they told me I had to be in charge of the clock, and I did such a bad job of it that in an hour-long show, I was over by a half an hour. <laughs> so I'm particularly sensitive to the blinking light that says, sorry, we need to wrap this wrap discussion. This discussion. Oh, it's, sorry. That's <laughs> Now, now I got the title of being the worst when it comes to the clock. Thank you very much for, for being here. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. wait. But listen, this is an incredibly this? interesting <laughs> and complex issue uh, to engage with, and we don't just need money, we need brain power. So we would love if you all went to water.org and started to read about it if you're interested. There's a lot to learn. It's endlessly intriguing and complex and fun to engage with, and there are real solutions out there, very real solutions that can help a lot of people very soon if we just engage with this. Matt, and just very quickly, the issues in, in India, and just a quick note about your, your work in India as well, mm -hmm. just before we wrap. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, we're, we're through this grant with PepsiCo Foundation, we're at, we, we were targeted to, uh, with, uh, to hit 800,000 people, which is essentially, really quickly I'll say, the, uh, the, co the philanthropic cost per person reached is, is, is $25 to give somebody uh, clean water for life if you're doing kind of well, classic well systems. We've driven that cost down to between 6 and $7 through these loan programs. So you're, you're getting much more bang for your buck and we've already hit our 800000 in India and we still have another year to Well, in, in the collaboration that's gone along with that, so with PepsiCo kind of paving the way and then we then have other foundations, you know, like IKEA Foundation, MasterCard, uh, Caterpillar, they've all then followed along behind this to add more capital to it to expand the model even further. We and think we could reach hundreds of millions of people. And we could reach hundreds, but McKinsey did a study for, we could definitely reach hundreds of millions of people and the president has been great. And when we talked to him, to President Clinton a few years ago, he just said, just keep running those numbers up. Just run them up. <laughs> uh, and he was right. That's exactly, the, uh, that's exactly what we need to do to prove the concept to get you all to understand that this really works because that's when people engage and we must move to the CGI video. Yeah. Now. <laughs> <laughs>